Memories of the Marshland Q&A. Nine people arrange themselves in a semicircle of chairs on stage. One steps forwards. Uh, hi. Um, my name is George Goodman. I'm a producer at Zuko. I'm a type of 10 white man with brown hair and a teal shirt. Um, it's a real pleasure to um, be introducing this chat at panel discussions that we're calling something academic. I don't know if it's going to be academic. Um, I, on the stage behind me are the creative team of the R&D we've been working on. You've already heard from Flo and Sam and Jack and anyone else, and I think that's over. Um, and so maybe we should just start by introducing ourselves um, so everyone knows who everyone is. Uh, I also see that the fantastic cast have assembled on the front row. Uh, so, uh, well, that one of our cast, and that's gorgeous. Um, can we start to consent to just work along? Yes. Hi everyone, I'm Nick. I'm one of the co-founders of Zoo uh, and I'm, I'm a sound designer on this um, R&D. I'm a 30-year-old, 6 foot 3 white man with a shaved head, dark moustache and dark eyebrows. And um, that's all you need to know about climate. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Fleur. I'm one of the co-founders of Zuko. I'm also the creative access director at Zuko. Um, I'm a better old white woman with lots of brown hair in hair. Um, I'm Amelia, I'm a pronoun to live them. I'm one half of Quiplash, the other half of Quiplash is Al, who's somewhere in the audience, I don't know where. Because I can't see you, but it's fine. Um, I am a, I, I was working as a blind access consultant kind of trainer and hopped in at the very beginning to run a workshop around uh, creative integrated audio description and then ran away and let them do their thing and then come back to watch the sharing. Um, I am a slim white human with a brown mullet and a little pink cap on and I've got a white hoodie and very colourful trousers and trainers on. Hi everyone, I'm Jack, my pronouns are he, him. I am the writer and movement director for this r and I'm a 5 foot 3 white man with uh, sharp cheekbones, blue eyes, brown hair, every time I'm going to get the cheekbones yeah. in. Sorry. <laughs> 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 Flo, a white woman with brown hair. Sam, a white man with shaved hair. Hi, I'm Ben. Uh, I'm a big white bloke with short blonde hair that's shaped really short and a long scruffy beard, wearing a peach jumper, black jeans and white trainers, and holding my white cane in my hand and folded up. Uh, I was here as a drama turkey type person, uh, a bit of a particular um, here on audio description stuff. Uh, yeah, that's me. I was here for the last couple of days hanging out causing trouble. <laughs> Hello, I'm Catherine Turner. I'm a 43-year-old white woman, long brown hair, wearing black trousers and a dark red top, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I was, and I'm sitting in my wheelchair, um, I was brought in to have a look at the script, give some feedback on that from a sort of sensitivity reading, and to give some feedback and ideas about the audio description from them audience point of view as it's being developed. Great, thanks everyone. Um, I'm really keen to welcome any questions we might have from the floor, I can call it the floor, from the baby seating. Um, but before, uh, before I invite people to ask questions, I want to jump in with one um, for Amelia, because you joined us at the beginning of this process before we knew what we were doing. Yeah. A bit of deep, we still know, even that now we know what we're doing. But like, you had the, uh, you know, we all had the privilege of sitting in this room over six days and exploring this world, this language, this set of processes, this way of working. And um, having said hello to us when we were at the idea stage, you now sort of parachuted back in mm. at the end, see where it took us. So, um, and you also spend a lot, of, a lot of your time thinking about various audio description in theatre. Um, so I think it would be great to hear your thoughts on generally where, um, like what the state of audio description is in theatre, well, <laughs> uh, as, as a, like a starting point for a discussion, but also if there's anything about this afternoon's performance that has um, kind of sparked some new thoughts about that. Mm. Uh, yeah, so I guess 
guess just for anybody who doesn't know from my credentials, my special interest and job is doing integrated audio description in various things as a performer, as a director, as a consultant, <coughs> as a dramaturg, as a whatever people will let me do it as. <laughs> uh, I've also quite literally co-written the book that a lot of people use on it, so I say that uh, so that my wife doesn't, because they will, um, and it is true. Uh, even if it makes me sound a little bit hot on myself, but I think it's really hard, so I did it. Uh, uh, anyway, um, and so, so basically that is to say, I, and I'm also a blind person, so I need audio description to literally do basically everything. So, um, uh, so yeah, the state of audio description in theater in my experienced opinion, and my guess is I'm not the only blind person on this panel that feels this way, is that it is often uh, the thing that is overlooked the most uh, in theater. I, I, I think that it is important that disabled people and people who work in disability arts acknowledge that there is a hierarchy uh, of access, and it does shift and change. I think a lot of disabled people talk about like, who's the featured uh, disability for the year? Is it deaf people again? Or is it, um, or is it, you know, and like, and like, and that's not to be shady to deaf people too much, but no, um, but like, you know, like blind, we don't get our year. We have never gotten our year. When do blind people get to be cool is a question I constantly have, because we are really, really fucking cool. Uh, but there is, there's some politics around, uh, blindness and complacency and an expectation that we'll just sort of be happy to be here even if we don't know what's going on. Um, and there's also a real lack of understanding of the amount of work uh, and resources and time and uh, expertise and talent that is needed to do any style of audio description. And also what a really beautiful, powerful, creative tool it can be for not only access for blind and visually impaired people, it also helps a lot of neurodivergent people, also, what a really powerful dramaturgical creative tool it is. And so the workshop that I ran for this piece was literally about like, here is what you can do to make this help you do the storytelling. Because really what audio description is, is context. That's what it is. Nobody sees the same thing, regardless of how they quote unquote see it or understand it, um, even if they're looking at the same thing. So what you do is you get a context that means we can all meet in the middle and go, I think I understood stand your experience and I hope you understand mine. And um, that's a really powerful thing to be able to do. And it's, it's some, but it's something that moves on disability time. It doesn't move on normative time. Um, and I think a lot of creatives and companies, especially right now in the I'm going to use very heavy air quotes here, post-pandemic, because we're still very much in it, world, are trying to move to something that feels fast-paced, uh, comfortable, uh, something that will bring in money <laughs> in a small amount of time. And so I feel like, since things have opened up again, audio description has even fallen down a few more rungs. So knowing that companies like Zuko are doing this, and taking the time to do it, while acknowledging you know, what was said at the beginning of like, We've worked with this demographic of people, and it was great, we worked with this demographic of people, we haven't worked with blind people yet, and we need to fix that, is wonderful. That's a really lovely place for anybody to be. Um, so that's my like TED Talk <laughs> spiel about that stuff. Uh, thanks. <laughs> In terms of this piece, I, it's, so, it's so hard when you are creative to, who also needs audio description as an audience member, to not like, try and place my mind in the seat of the director and the performer and the producer. And I know uh, from a director standpoint, and maybe produ production standpoint, that when you are working with a new group of people and especially access needs that you've not interacted with before, the most important thing that you do first, even if the end goal is this will be accessible to audiences, is you make sure that your cast is okay. Mm -hmm. You make sure there's a real symmetry in how your cast works together. And what the thing that I think was the most exciting to me about this, which you did in six days, which is not a lot of time, is from my perspective, the cast seemed really seamless and really, and I, you know, like really like y'all were working really well together, and you all had really lovely moments of being featured and like showing how strong and talented you all are, which is great. I'm emotioning towards the right, because I think that's where you are. <laughs> yes, nailed it. Psychic, I have a fifth sense. Anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, and I think that um, if that means 
of like those audio guides a lot of the time um, <coughs> can be super specific about information, overloading with information about that yeah. particular painting. I think that's something that's really good. Really, I mean, it's sort of about the mechanics, and I think it's sort of like one thing that I'm really curious about is I think when we talk about integrated audio description, people get scared of using headsets, for example, because they feel it has to be open all the time. But part of me that there should there needs to be equitability for audio. It's not equality, equitability, where a vision impaired person's experience is the same or is at the same level as another member of the audience's experience. So that could be through using headsets. And I think also speaking within this framework, the idea of using uh, describing the mechanics of the show. It's sort of like, I want to know how the magic trick is made. And I think that's a really good way. But Penn and Teller, for example, their whole shtick is about how a magic trick works. And, but you still are amazed at the magic trick. And it's trying to work out a way of that that can come in auditorily without also, and I'm saying I'm going to be clumsy with my words, damaging sort of this dramaturgical fluidity you might have with the movement sequence. So it's not some kind of jolted experience. You have this gorgeous, like, uh, these sticks are moving and bodies are moving in a sexy way, and then I have the going, the bodies are moving in a sexy way. <laughs> that's not, that's not even going to give you anything about the story. It's trying to work out the language through a process of development. Yeah. That is what, what would be that kind of equitable form that a vision impaired audience would get through a distinctly and traditionally visual medium. I think that's actually quite exciting to sort of engage with. There's, a, there's an analogy I often use, I think I said this in the workshop, um, is that what you, you, blind people can't see, right, duh. Um, and we're not coming to a show with audio description to expect the audio description to do the same thing as seeing. We, we know what our world is, we know it's not sighted. And like, we are all whatever level of comfortable we are with that. Um, the thing that we want is a parallel experience. We want to be able to go to the bar and have a conversation with a sighted person and be talking about the same show. Mm, yeah. Or, if we're talking about different experiences of the same show, we want to know that that was a really clear, conscious choice. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've been in shows where, like you're saying, Sam, there was creative audio description that was like character-driven and built in with the dramaturgy that was in a headset. And I knew, because I was told through that access in the story, my experience was different than the sight of people, but actually that was really empowering because I got a bunch of stuff that the sight of people did not. And it was super cool to kind of go in and like, yeah, there were jokes that I got that you didn't hear, and you heard me laughing, and you were confused. Because <laughs> like, it's a literal power dynamic flip when that kind of stuff happens. Yeah. Um, and like, it is, it is about... It's a creative tool. So you are making conscious choices as opposed to going, um, you know, like it's not an IKEA manual. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think I think just as like a final reflection on that, what, what Amelia was saying is about, especially with things like jokes and what it's, it's about information. Yeah. And I think in a show, a play, a comedy, drama, whatever the genre, it is about information and timing. But the one thing that really gets me is sort of like as a blind audience member. If I don't get to say the best analogy I have is the joke till after a while after everybody else has gotten it. So for example, in a farce, somebody <coughs> slips on a banana peel, audience is laughing, then I get a headset going 10 seconds later, they slipped on a banana peel and I go, oh, that's not yeah. funny, it's ruined the, the rhythm, the musicality of that entire scene. Yeah, so I say, well, this week, I think, uh, it's basically what I was trying to say, but I'll say it in my own clumsy way, uh, which was that I don't want to have the good experience that everyone else is having described to me. Mm. I want to have a good experience. Yes, that's not clumsy, that's really good. I knew that. Bam. <laughs> <laughs> Sexy in the theatre industry is getting us in as audio description consultants. Mm -hmm. 
And um, I, you know, I've got, to, I've got to work on some amazing shows and in some amazing buildings and amazing rehearsal rooms as an AV consultant. And those rooms and those buildings would never consider having me there as an actor or a director yeah. or a creative. And that feels really mucky. So I, I, my ethics get really tested by that. Mm -hmm. And I'm making a, a good living doing this audio description consultancy stuff, but actually, true like equity and true uh, inclusion, it, it, like, and all this stuff feeds into it. So like, uh, you, we need some represent true, genuine representation on stage, and genuine access for audiences, and engagement in a participatory manner, or whatever it might be with the vision impaired community from from theatre organisations. All those things play into each other. And, uh, and, uh, and, and actually, for me, if it's just one of those elements, and normally it's just the access for audiences things, if it's only that, then it feels like tick boxing. It feels there's like a, a bit of it. There's a literal trend that we, we I know, uh, for flash, we, we know this because we've been talking to somebody who is doing some research on this, that right now, uh, the general arts funding is really happy to fund uh, people in privilege to bring on minoritized people. This isn't even just about disabilities, it's about a lot of different minoritized groups as consultants, and they're not funding these these mm. people's actual work. Exactly. And uh, yeah, like uh, we got rejected for two different grants last week. <laughs> Yay! Uh, for stuff that was focused on audio description, and like you know, it's really it, it, it's, a, it's a jungle out there right now. It's tough. So like, it's not as easy to say like it was discrimination. But then when you hear that in relation to that kind of stuff, and it's echoed in in what other people in my same arts community are saying, it feels really. Interesting, and I think there's something there's something nice about a company that can get the privilege to get funding to go. Let's bring in a blind director. We'll just we'll just we'll just uh, we'll just we'll do the, we'll do the bit that that the uh, the, the rest of the system isn't going to do for you. And um, I think uh, I, I don't know, just more of that, please. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think for us, I mean, we just found that some, that's a necessity for the art to be what we want it to be. Um, we wouldn't be able to like. There's like a, 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 a like a well, of course, like what am I trying to say? It's an obvious thing when you say we want this work to be culturally uh, relevant to the audience. It's about and there's two like do you know, like the story insists on it. Um, whereas I suppose uh, I don't know a staging of I don't know how to not be shady, like a big Shakespeare production in a mid-scale regional venue doesn't have that call to action in, in, in the text, they kind of add it on afterwards. And whereas, like, I don't, there's a sort of impossible, like, what that kind of uh, thing, I, I guess, and then the work gets, gets better or more, more exciting or more detailed. And, and we gain more, um, I don't know, when I was co-directing with a deaf director, on work, like the amount of permission I get as a hearing person to kind of fuck with access and be more brave about it. Whereas as a hearing person, I just have to go uh, make sure everything's signed, and everything's captioned, it's got to be clear. Uh, and someone like Duffy, who I uh, recently co-directed with, will be like, "Nah, fuck it, I don't, I don't want that. I want this. I want, I want this uh, to be more, I don't know, brave around around that, or, or have more humour or wittiness around uh, those identities because we're not kind of holding them." from the outside going like, you know, I don't know, I'm waffling a bit, but um, that's, that's something that... Uh, just to like cap this off, there is a, if folks are familiar with the principles of disability justice, which if you're not, you should be, mm -hmm. um, and it's free to look up on the internet, on the interwebs, and they have multiple different formats and ways you can read it, including easy read um, and plain language and that kind of stuff. One of the principles is leadership of the most impacted. So if you are making something about a specific group of people, you want it to be led by those people. And in general, people who face more, the idea is that people who face more oppression uh, will understand systems more and will be able to help navigate them better. Mm. And so it is, it's, it is that kind of stuff where um, giving, giving those of us that face barriers, the, the agency to remove them ourselves, means that everybody kind of hopefully has a better time, learns stuff, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's a good way, it's a good way to it's a good way to be. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I'm, I'm conscious we don't have a huge amount of time and I uh, there may be questions and thoughts in the audience about things that we haven't yet touched on. So I'd love to know uh, if anyone has a question or a comment they'd like to make. Uh, don't be shy. <laughs> no. 
Hi, um, my name's Andy, I'm the front house manager at uh, Jackson Sang here. Um, I think the main thing I just want to say is a big thank you for doing this work. Um, as a venue, we present quite a lot of circle, surface work and a lot of non-verbal work. So this isn't an area of, of um, access that we explore much as a venue. Um, it presents its own challenges and I think um, just seeing, seeing the performance today and hearing this Q&A has really opened my eyes on, on, and kind of helped me think about the way that um, we can invite audiences and artists into the space. Um, and just, it, yeah, just a big thank you really for me. Well, uh, as you can see, it's one more, I can recommend me, Sam, and all of you. I have some shows, you want to show? We'll have very reasonable consultancy rates. We also make our own work. Exactly. If we can make something new, what do you want? <laughs> I do circus. <laughs>
play with as writer and movement director would be the fact that actually Ava's, Ava lands in the world differently, mm. or perhaps can, can yeah, we, we, we begin to get away from that idea that the world is happening to Ava, but perhaps it's interesting that that's where we start. Oh yeah, it, it needs that, but, but you know, the, the, the glass falling off is lovely. I want to see another time where she smacks the glass off the table because she knows it's her world now. Mm. You know, that combination of things, but it's, you know, this yeah. is a fantastic thing to watch. And it was a great pleasure to see, and the work you've done in this time is amazing. Uh, and, and it's only worth offering an opinion because it has so much potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. Um, it's, we are at the end of a six day process, and it's really important that uh, the team and the cast gets uh, a moment to kind of close that process privately. Um, so, but if anybody would like, uh, has other burning things to discuss, from about six o'clock, uh, we will have left this place and be out in the cafe. So do stick around if you would like to, if you need to talk to us. Um, uh, cast and creative team, we're going to uh, stay and check out. I'd like to thank everyone else for being here and showing us this experience yeah, with us. Thank you so much. Um, and particularly thank you to the cast for that extraordinary sharing of six days.